I'm Ted Simmerall. Um, at one time I was a, an owner of the HLN and Rod Company. I uh, was with them about 10 years. And uh, in 1960, well actually 67 to 78, so that's like 11 years, but we won't argue about it. Uh, when we talk about Leonard, um, most of the Leonard history from the time that he was, especially the time that he was in Bangor, has been well documented and well well written. People have researched, gone through all the records, the real estate records and everything else in Bangor. They can tell you what street he was on, but then he moved and, you know, he was a gun maker and he worked with Philbrook and then, you know, all these things have pretty much been explained. Uh, and uh, you can read, you can read several books on that. Probably the, one of the better ones is Marty Keene's book um, because he did a lot of research um, as far as Leonard was concerned. But there's a key, couple of key things that happened when he moved from Bangor down to Central Valley uh, because he brought with him uh, Edwards, Thomas, the Hawes brothers, possibly Ed Payne. Nobody that I ever could find uh, that uh, Ed Payne came down from, from there uh, with him. Uh, one of the key people that he hired when he got down to Central Valley was a guy by the name of George Reynolds. And George Reynolds was a spindle maker for stairs. So the guy had all kinds of experience on turning wood on, on, on lathes and everything else. And he became a member of the Central Valley group. I bring him out because he had two sons, Ralph Reynolds, who for many, many, many years did unbelievable metal work for Leonard Rod Company. His brother, Harold, eventually took over the Rod Company uh, as the manager up there. Um, the store in New York City, William Mills and Son, uh, the family actually owned Leonard Rod Company. And they had an interlocking director in which uh, Arthur, Mill, Arthur C. Mills was the president of both Leonard Rod Company and William Mills and Son. He had two sons, one Steve and one Arthur C. III, who was nicknamed Hap Mills. Now, Hap was vice president of William Mills store, and Steve was vice president of Leonard. The mother was secretary and treasurer of both companies. They had a tremendous amount of influence uh, on what happened with Leonard. When Leonard moved to Central Valley, uh, and there's a little bit of confusion, I think, on how, how Mills eventually got into the whole program. Uh, while Iron was still in Bangor, he designated uh, William Mills and Son as sole agents. And so they were selling his rods out of their store at 21 Park Place in New York. Uh, the question then comes, well, how did, how did Mills' family become owners, or at least part owners, of the Leonard Rod Company. And uh, Jerry and I have talked about this. Um, Hiram actually took out a loan or a mortgage, whichever way you want to look at it, uh, from an individual in Boston by the name of Kidder. And Kidder eventually, either because Hiram didn't pay or he wanted to get rid of his mortgage or, or loan, he sold it to William Mills and Son. So William Mills and Son got a percentage of the, the rod company. Hiram still owned a portion of it, but the, the loan was um, backed up by everything that Hiram owned. Hiram let it own. So anyway, um, what happened at the tail end of the 1890s um, was a, a split in the Leonard Rod Company. Um, and I think that was mostly due to the fact that William Mills and Son really promoted Leonard. I mean, really, really promoted Leonard. They went to exhibitions in Europe. Uh, they had 
casting championships. They, they, they did all sorts of things. They built rods for the King of Greece, for the King of Italy. Um, they did all, all sorts of, of um, exhibitions and shows to promote Leonard. Uh, business really started to boom. And the pressure on building more rods, uh, having a greater influence in what was being built, built, how they were being built, what should be done, came from the Mills family. The, the prior, the, the most important, uh, I should say, of the Mills family was an individual called Thomas Bate Mills. And uh, the Mills store actually opened in 1822. And they sold, initially they sold needles from England, Birmingham, England. They got into fish hooks, kind of similar, right? And from fish hooks, they got into fishing and became, at one time, one of the premier stores, fishing tackle stores in the United States, if not the world. Um, and they were known all over. Um, but what happened then, at, in the end of the, of the uh, 1890s, um, people started to leave. Um, Payne left, Edwards left, the Hawes brothers left, Thomas left, um, which brought up, shortly thereafter, brought up a lawsuit against Leonard, or against Hawes, because one of the Hawes married Cora Leonard, and they started to produce a rod they call um, the Leonard Hawes. Well, the trademark, Leonard had a trademark on the, uh, actually trademark reads the Leonard Rod. I mean, that was a very, very strong trademark. I mean, you couldn't, you couldn't make a pair of underwear and call it Leonard. I mean, it was that tight. Well, they sued Hawes and eventually they, they dropped the Leonard part of it and it just became the Hawes Rod Company. But that split occurred shortly thereafter, 1907, Hiram passed away. His nephew, not his son, but some people say, oh, it's Hiram's son. No, it was his nephew, Reuben Leonard, took over the production of the rod, uh, or the rod company. He was an unbelievable rod uh, caster. And he actually would, would go on out, have a rod made, he'd go on out and cast it. And he'd come back in and he'd file a pattern a little bit, uh, change it couple thousands here, a couple thousands there, make another one, take it out, cast it. So the, the patterns, the steel patterns, sometimes you'd find there'd be a, a four inch section that the steel had been cut out and a brass piece had been added in to increase the, increase the uh, dimension just slightly and then file smooth. So he was uh, extremely particular and I think he was the one that developed uh, the famous 50DF, uh, which came around. I, the earliest that I could find is, a, and I'm just estimating really, but 19, about 1910 is when Leonard came out with a three-piece 50DF, which is probably overall Leonard's most famous rod. Um, it wasn't called the world's best rod. That, that belongs to another individual. But it, uh, it was the, uh, the beginning of the dry fly, as we call it now, the dry fly syndrome that came out. So rods started to be faster, quicker, shorter. Um, basically, your trout rods prior to that were nine foot, nine and a half, ten foot trout rods. And uh, to come out with an eight foot rod uh, was really spectacular for the time. Uh, they were done, uh, and I'll, a little bit about the three-piece rods, because the older rod makers didn't believe in two-piece rods. Um, and I talked to, to Jim Payne about it, and uh, talked to Ed Garrison about it, and a few others. Um, they felt that in the middle of a rod, depending on, on the taper and everything else, but the center section of the rod was where you had that transition from power to delicacy, okay? So that at the middle is a very crucial point. 
when you're doing a, a rod, a three-piece rod. And of course, you can play around with a three-piece rod. I mean, you can change the mid, you can change the tips, you can, but you can't with a two-piece rod. Anyway, two-piece rods really weren't in fashion. Uh, they were always three-piece. So all your Catskill, baby Catskill, uh, all the three-piece rods, I mean, all the rods that were done in, in this time period were always, were always three-piece rods, never two-piece rods. That, they didn't come on until uh, a little later on. Um, Reuben Leonard uh, ran Leonard Rod Company until 1920. And his, his, he was the one that developed uh, more of the, of the designs that, that uh, we know as, as Leonard. Hiram, Hiram was basically built a lot of, or designed a lot of big salmon rods and a lot of 10 foot, 10 and a half foot trout rods. And that was his strong <coughs> The most important thing that he did, or one of the Hawes boys, we're not sure, was uh, the development of the bevel. Uh, up until then, people were hand planing rods um, in various forms. You see Leonard, there's a famous picture of Leonard at his workbench working on filing, filing some uh, joints down. But the beveler was the key to Leonard's success because at that point, you could cut rods, you could make rods down as close as a half a thousandth of an inch uh, in, as far as the dimensions were. Unbelievable piece of machinery. I ran it for several years, and uh, I still I still marvel at it, and I still wonder. I, I, there's some things that I never did work with, I never did use it. Had a multiplier, and you could take a certain pattern, right, and that had a drop to it. You could change the drop in the pattern by this multiplier. You could multiply the the rate of drop, um, the, the size or the dimensions, um, it was, it was a, just very complicated, hard to set up because the way the original beveler was, um, you had two, two saw blades that came in and almost touched, right? And there at your 60, very, very close to 60 degree angle. And the way the, the beveler head was set up, you could get that 60 degrees, but the 60 degrees could be over here, or up here, or down over here on the side, and you had to really play with that thing to get it together. So if you had to take it apart to sharpen blades, uh, you'd never touch the spindle. <coughs> I mean, you took the blades out, sharpened them, and put them back, and never took that, uh, that bevel head apart. Um, so I said Hiram died, Carlton King, took over, or Ruben took over. Carlton took over in 1920 and worked until 1930, in which one of the Reynolds brothers, Harold Reynolds, took over. There's not much going on between, say, 1910 and 1940. Uh, there's not much history. I mean, Leonard made rods. William Mills and Son Solo, they became famous all over the world. People wanted Leonard Rods. Uh, the thing that amazed me is that by 1930, there were 97 Leonard patterns. Leonard made 97 rods from the one ounce, 36L or 37L at that time, the one ounce rod all the way on up to seven foot, seven and a half foot, tuna and shark rods that were triple built. There were 97 different rods, 97 different models. Not all of them were made all the time, for sure. A lot of them were special order. I don't think they made an awful lot of big salmon rods either. There was 18 foot. I know they made at least one 18 foot because we got that in one time. But uh, uh, the productions stayed steady. Uh, people made, made their rods. Uh, it, it was just a time period when the company was flourishing. It was just moving along and nobody changed anything. 
There's no status quo, the status quo just remained. No major models were developed until the tail end of the 30s uh, when you started to develop the two-piece rods. And that became, um, talking with Harold, Harold Reynolds, um, that, that was a nightmare because nobody had any real patterns for two-piece. Um, so something had to be done, something had to be changed. Um, they did be, they were able to develop some patterns using the, the three-piece patterns and uh, the butt section off the three-piece and the tip section. Um, so these were starting to be developing the, the two-piece rods and um, what happened in probably, well, it was 1950, there was the bamboo embargo from China. And Leonard had a considerable amount of bamboo, but during the Second World War, they, they used a lot of it making rods because they weren't getting any from China. And there was one point where um, somebody would order a rod during that time period, and the rod couldn't be made. But Mills, the Mills family, like Arthur C. Mills or somebody, had one. So they sold, they sold one of their own rods to their customers. A couple of them came out up to be refinished, and they would refinish them complete and send them back down to William Mills. I assume that they sold them to somebody, but that's how bad the, the situation was with the <coughs> bamboo. Um, Around 1950, into our early 60s, Mills changed their whole catalog. If you remember, there were little catalogs, mostly, mostly uh, kind of an olive green, that were about, what, five by seven or something like that? Yeah. Little, little catalogs, right? And then they decided to go modern, and they started out with a large catalog, um, beautiful cover design of painting and all that. And uh, they cut the number of Leonard rods down to a reasonable number. They did the trout rods, they did the salmon dry fly rods, and the double-handed salmon rods. Everything else got eliminated. No bait casting rods, no spinning rods, no heavy saltwater rods, nothing in that category. So that was in the, in the 60s. Late 50s they started, and in the 60s they put out the new catalog. Um, then of course we come to what many people thought was the end of Leonard, which was the fire of 1964, uh, which burned the building completely to the ground. Uh, many people thought, well, that's the end of Leonard Rod, because the rumor came out that all the patterns and all the documentation was gone. Um, and that they would never build anything again. Uh, what happened, what precipitated, I think, that more than anything else, is that the west end of the building was the downstairs was where the beveler and all the patterns and all the other were stored. And in an attempt to get in and fight the fire, they brought a bulldozer in that tore down that back wall. And the rumor then was that the bulldozer ran over the patterns and the patterns burned and the beveler burned and that was the end of it. Well, this, the main thing that was saved were the steel patterns. There were patterns that were made of wood. The pattern was cut in either oak or maple and the taper was in the wood. And then a brass sheet was, was put over the top of that to run through the beveler. So that the wood wouldn't, wouldn't the wood wouldn't wear out. Well, those burned. So all you had was you know a six foot strip of brass that was you know half inch wide. But the steel patterns remained. The steel patterns um, had to be straightened a little bit because of the heat. Uh, but the the main patterns that were left and that were that were available and used were a tip pattern, a mid pattern, 
a butt pattern, and a tip for a double-handed salmon rod, which was different than any of the other tips that they made. Yes. Quick question. I mean, cause of the fire? Do we? I mean, electrical. It was electrical. Yeah, they, they determined it was electrical. I'm not sure why. <laughs> it it happened during the day, night, or I mean, it just. No, I'm not. No, it happened. I think after work. After okay, work. so it's just yeah, but yeah, it, it looks as the fire, the fire, but it's yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, then came the big, the big question to the Mills family was, do we continue the H.O. Leonard Rod Company? And uh, the decision was made to, yes, to rebuild the factory, um, to uh, continue the Leonard Rod Company, which was a, which was a major decision because it was uh, a big investment. Now, the, the key to the whole thing to me, was the fact that the beveler had survived. That was melt. The frame, the run, everything else on the beveler was made of wood. That went, I mean, that burned. But the head, the beveler head remained. Um, so that was the key. Now, um, what happened was um, at that particular time, 1964 fire, they, they rebuilt, rebuilt everything, and in 1960, well, 65, 66, they decided that uh, Arthur C. Mills III, Hap Mills, would now run Leonard Rod Company. And uh, he'd gotten out of the Air Force, and uh, from what I can understand, I'm <coughs> talking with Harold Reynolds, that. Uh, he didn't know anything. He didn't know anything at all. So Harold uh, helped in building, rebuilding the beveler, uh, rebuilding the splitter, doing all a, a lot of the things that were necessary, and taught uh, Hat Mills how to how to run the beveler, which was key to it. Um, unfortunately, um, everybody else quit. Uh, there was, I don't know. Bobby was there, Bobby Taylor was a very, very, um, very close to this, closer than I was, and I'll cover that in a minute. But you had, you had Ralph Reynolds, <coughs> Harold Reynolds left. He wasn't going to do rod making anymore. Um, his brother, Ralph, stayed on. Uh, the last apprentice they hired was Al Stevens, and at that time he was 72 years old. Um, you had Ralph. Reynolds, Al Stevens, and you had Ethel Frost and the Winder, who actually wound rods for 67 years. I mean, she knew them all. <coughs> she didn't. She may have met Hiram at one time. I don't know, but she she uh, definitely was there for a long, long time, and she was incredible, uh, incredible winder. And I can remember. A, short, a little bypass thing here. Um, she would take, get rods in, um, rod guides in from perfection. Perfection tipped up out of Colorado. And she'd get a punch of them and she'd lay them on the table and look at them. And, uh, you know, play around and mess around and, you know. And uh, one day I noticed that the window in front of Ethel's bench was just open a little bit. And I watched. And that damn Ethel would go through and pick out rides and line them up, or guides, I'm sorry, and line them up like number two. These are all good number twos. That's a bad one. And then go out the window. And out in the back, around there, one day, there was, I don't know, I mean, you could, you could, you know, there's handfuls of guides outside the window. You know, but she would, had the eye that could say, well, this was done on wire forming machine number one, but this was done on number two, and they were put together in the same bunch, and she could tell the difference. She was unbelievable. 67 years, she wound rods. Every day, an unbelievable woman. Tough, tough, I'll tell you, she was tough. I mean, she, we send the rods back to the winding room, and all of a sudden that winding room door 
fly open and that will come down the hallway with a rod, you know. How do you expect me to wind that barrel? You know? <laughs> Bobby, you know that, right? Yeah, I know that. Yeah. 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 to me all the time. Yeah, you know, because yeah, yeah. when she wound, she wind the silk up over the over the guy, the guy had had the serrations in it. And they didn't quite come level, everything didn't quite come level with the bamboo, so you had to kind of file that in. Well, if she'd start winding, she'd wind on up, and the, the, the silk could hit that little spot and pop. And then, so Ethel would come stomping down the hallway, you know. How do you expect me to wind that? You know, I can't wind her body like that. So, yeah, she what, was was last huh? last what was Ethel's last name? Frosson. F-R-A-U-S-O-N. Okay. Ethel Frosson. <coughs> um, So when I got there, um, those were there was Al Stevens and I say uh, Ralph Reynolds and the two women, Virginia Lures, who'd been varnishing forever, and uh, went back and go sometimes back and forth to Jim Payne and varnish for Jim Payne for a while, um, and Bob Taylor had been hired uh, in what Bob sixty. 65? Yeah, I was still in high school. Yeah, and you, then he went in the military, went into yeah, service. Yeah, after in 67 I went into the military. You went in 67, just before I got there. So... Yeah, when I came back, you were working there. When I was there, yeah. yeah. And I think Mark, there was another individual, high schooler, Mark Murphy, yeah. uh, who was part-time, and he started in the cane room. And uh, he was doing some of the splitting and sanding and a few of the things. But he only worked part time on after school sometimes and on Saturday. Uh, people have always asked me, well, how the hell did you get involved in it? Uh, which is an interesting story. Um, my father had uh, a letter brought. He was a fly fisherman along with my, my uncle. And um, I used to take care of their bamboo rods. Um, they knocked the guy off, or Farrell would be loose, or it needed to be varnished, or something, you know. And I, so I played around with them. I, I could do work on rods. Nothing spectacular. I didn't make any rods or anything like that. But I was teaching in, in New York here, and my father had this Leonard. It was a Model 50. And he and my uncle were out going out fishing. And I don't know whether they were in a canoe or where they were or anything else, but <clears throat> the rod was all, my father's rod was all done, you know, all strung up. And my uncle comes out and he slips or trips, steps into the boat, into the, whatever it was, and stepped on the butt section and broke it, uh, cracked it, the butt section. And uh, so my father's, you know, he, this thing had been sitting there for years, not that long, but anyway, he said, look, at William Mills and son is in New York. Why don't you go down and get my rod fixed? I said, okay, fine. So we sent it out, and I went down and eventually found William Mills and son, and uh, talked to an individual by the name of Bill Buckley, who was um, the heart and soul of the Mills family at that time. And uh, there were customers that came in and wouldn't talk to anybody but Bill Buckley. You know, he was great. Anyway, he says, well, where are you living? And I told him where I was living. I was up, you know, in New York. He said, well, how far are you from Central Valley? I said, I don't know, 10 miles, 50. He said, well, take it up there. You know, go on up there. Take it. Instead of having it here and then us sending it up there, why don't you just go on up to the factory? So I said, okay. So I went up to the factory and I talked to Hap Mills. He was there. Bob was in the service by then. And uh, he said, what can I do for you? I said, well, I need a, I need a section, butt section for a 50 DL. And he said, well, where's the rod? So I said, well, here's the rod, you know. And he said, well, yeah, that's a 50 DF, blah, 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 blah. And I said, he said, so you want us to repair it? I said, no, I just want the butt section. I'll do the rest of it myself. And he says, what do you mean you'll do it yourself? And I said, well, I'll, I'll put it together. It's just a butt, you know. I can put that. I got the wheel seat and all this other kind of stuff and a ferrule. All I got to do is find some cork someplace and I can make it up, you know. And he said, well, you can do that kind of stuff? I said, yeah. He said, well, why don't you sit down here and and look at these repairs we got in here, right? <laughs> so <laughs> there weren't any there weren't any rods. I think there were a few rods being made at that time. Uh, 
I think the first year in, that it actually came into production, there were seven rods made, right? A lot of repairs had come in from William Mills and stuff. So I said, oh, okay, fine. He says, well, let's see what you do, you know? So, you know, he says, strip this one. So I stripped it down. He said, oh, yeah, you didn't cut the bamboo or anything, you know? What? Oh, we can take the ferrule off? Well, yeah, they're pinned, right? And he said, yeah, they're pinned. You know, I took the ferrule off. And so he says, well, you're a kind of interesting guy. And I said, well, thank you very much, you know? And he says, uh, you want to work here? I said, well, I teach. I'm teaching, you know? And he says, well, he says, well, I'll give you the key and you can come in on, on nights and weekends and do whatever you want. And uh, he says, uh, you know, Al Stevens was doing repairs and he didn't straighten rods. So he said, I'll, you can take this bench over here and <clears throat> rods that need to be straightened and, and worked on you know, <laughs> whatever uh, he can't do, you know, you can do. So I said, okay, fine. You know? So I did that. And uh, that's, when I, that's how I started. And in 1968, maybe 69, I'm really not sure, uh, you could get bamboo again from, from uh, China. The ping pong policy, uh, Nixon and the ping pong policy freed up uh, bamboo. Prior to that, um, you couldn't you couldn't use bamboo. You couldn't have bamboo that was that wasn't purchased prior to 1950. <coughs> that didn't apply to England. So I had conversations and some some writing to an individual called Harold Sharp, uh, who owned Sharp Rod Company or Sharp Fishing Tackle, and uh, they used to make a rod called a Scotty. And they made all kinds of splice rods, and they were big, big time. They were in, <coughs> they were in competition, really, with Hardy to some sort, but at a lower level. And so I talked to Harold, and I said, "You got bamboo?" He said, "Yeah." What do you want? I said, "No, we got, we're, we're, we're stuck here. We don't, we don't have bamboo. We don't have bamboo. We can't get any bamboo." And uh, he said, "Yeah, I'll, I'll send you bamboo." And uh, rather than, than sending eight-foot columns across the Atlantic. Uh, we talked, and uh, I said, well, look it. Suppose you cut, them, you cut uh, the bamboo and split it for us so that we now got half-inch strips. And he said, well, yeah, I can do that. I said, well, you got to color code. If you can do it, you can, cut, can you color code? I mean, you get the three-on-three -three note pattern, <coughs> <clears throat> you have to have two to match up, and they got to stay together. So we said, yeah, we just mark one on red and one on black. Great. You know? So instead of getting, you know, 100 columns of bamboo, you know, in big tubes coming in by freight, you know, we got nice little bundles of bamboo that came in by air, right? So this, this, um, this made things a lot easier for us. Um, we were able, eventually, to the to the ping pong policy. Um, do you know why that? Do you know why? Do you know why that was? Why bamboo was prohibited? It was. Oh you know, yeah, it was the. I used to. I have brain. I'm used to now. I can't. I'm trying to remember. Well, there was. One, somebody, some legislator or lobbyist, um, got this idea, or from somebody, that the industrial waste rooms, heavy duty rooms, right? Um, the broom, the actual broom, was made out of bamboo, split bamboo, in a very small toothpick size things, and they made a great heavy duty brush. Well, some lobbyist or somewhere was trying to protect some brush company that was making them out of nylon or what the hell ever it was. So they said, well, they wanted the bamboo, split bamboo to be prohibited. So they said, okay, fine. So they tacked that onto some bill. And some guy says, well, my father owns a split bamboo fly rod. 
Okay, well then all bamboo was uh, declared that <coughs> you couldn't be imported. So it had to do with a, with a brush that had nothing to do with bamboo rod, but it was called split bamboo, and that's why it got, um, that came about. Um, so after, I, I came on in 19, as I say, getting back to this bamboo thing, um, Charles Demarest got, started getting bamboo again, and a big mills had ordered a very large shipment uh, because they were running short. And so William Mills in South was having difficulties in New York in their fishing business. And they actually didn't have enough money to pay for the bamboo coming in from Demarest. So they came to me and said, can you help us out? And I said, well, yeah, I can, I can help you out. I mean, what's, what's the deal? And they needed X amount of money to finish paying off or to pay for the bamboo. So I said, okay, um, you want to do this as a loan or how do you want to do this? And he said, well, how would you like part of the company? And I said, well, I hadn't thought about that. And he said, well, I'll tell you what, you pay for bamboo, you get 45% of the company. Will you do it? And I said, well, yeah. <laughs> I said, I'll do it. I mean, at that particular time, I could see where, I at least had an idea where things were starting to go and where things were starting to move. And the name Leonard and, and the prestige and everything else. So, so I went ahead and, uh, and got involved with the company and actually became the vice president. And uh, it was it was pretty pretty interesting during that time period. But prior to that, William Mills and Son had sold a rod called the Mills Standard, and you'll see a lot of them. Uh, Mills Standard. They had special ferrules. Um, they had a special real seed, special stamp called the standard, and um, they wanted a lower price rod. Well, they were made out of Leonard beveler pattern sticks and, and seconds, and they, you know, they weren't up to the same quality as the Leonard. Well, when you start doing that, making rods out of imperfect joints or, you know, patterns where you run through to check your pattern but the note pattern wasn't the same as the Leonard Dollar. What happens when somebody orders that rod and you don't have any seconds? And you know, somebody says, we got to have this rod two weeks or whatever it is, you know. So you walk on over and you pull sticks out of the Leonard's, right? There's an awful lot of mill standard rods out there. That are that are built on on Leonard joints. I mean, that are top-notch Leonard. You can find an eight-foot, three-piece mill <laughs> standard that's exactly the same as a 50 DF. It's got different ferrules, different real seed on it, and everything else. Well, you can't do that anymore. I mean, you can't. That wasn't really the way to go. But William Mills and Son decided that they needed a lesser price rod. Um, so I thought about it, and it see how would you make a lesser priced rod? And I thought about it quite a bit, and one of the things that would bother me would be the fact that if you had a, a mill standard and a Leonard, and you brought them both to the factory to get refinished, the refinish cost would be the same. Even though you paid a lot less for one than you did the other. So it seemed to me that the rod, number one, wouldn't be as much maintenance, wouldn't be have a uh, cost to refinish or anything else. So I thought about it, I called Harold Sharp, and I said, Harold, can you make us some rods, some blanks? And he said, well, maybe. You know, what are they? And I said, well, I'm gonna make something that's impregnated. And uh, he said, well, why don't you go to Orvis? I said, well, 
they're not going to take us, I'll tell you that. They don't want to have anything to do with us, you know. Uh, so what I did was I took and mic'd a whole series of, of lenders and made a graph. Took the average of all of them, made a graph. Now the Leonard, if you went in and took a look at the the tapers on the pattern, the steel patterns, they weren't uniform. You had basically they were concave convex. Uh, if you plotted them, instead of getting a straight line, you'd get you get a, a curve that or a line dipped and straightened out and dropped a little bit and all that. So I laid those out and then did the tips and the butts two different graphs, and then I just drew a line right down through the middle of all of them and said, okay, that's the Duracane taper <coughs> for the tip, there's the Duracane taper for the butt. So then I flew over to England with to see Harold, and he also says, those aren't going to work. You know, what are you, what are you doing? You know, those, because their tapers are totally different. Um, he says, okay, he says, if that's what you want, that's what you get. So. I ordered 500 blanks from Harold. And they came in and, and we started making them. And uh, they, were sold, they were sold out in a matter of six months. Fortunately, at this time, in the early, early 1970s, Mills decided that, William Mills and Son decided that uh, they wanted to redo the store and they wanted to change things. And they, turned over the store um, to Steve Mills, past brother, he became the president, and Arthur C. Mills, the third. Hey, well, by the way, anybody have a 38 ACM? Yes. Yeah. ACM, <coughs> Arthur C. Mills. Yeah. You know, some people say, what the hell is an ACM? You know, well, it's, it's a rod that, that he thought wanted to have made, and they, they made it, and they called it the ACM, Marcus E. Mill. Anyway. What, what's the story on the 37 ACM? Ah, which the, I have. 37 ACM? Same. Just, he wanted a six foot. Um, is it Mark 37 ACM? 37 ACM. And their catalog. Yeah, okay. That's and the... It's, it's the next... It's, well, no, there's three, there were... Well, the 37L, 37L, 37, and then you had the ACM, which was a step <coughs> down from the 38H. Yeah, so they're, but it's a six footer. Six footer. And they're like one in five eighths ounces or something like that. Yeah, probably, probably. Yeah. I've got one with me. Yeah. Yeah, nice little yeah. rod. A yeah, deep little rod, yeah. Yeah, yeah. nice little rod. But I've only yeah. ever seen a couple. Of them. Yeah. Um, I'll cover that in a minute, though. But uh, <laughs> what happened is that, as I started to say, William Mills and Sons started to get into camping, and they tried selling guns for a while, and that didn't work because the time that they decided to sell guns is when you had to have registration and, and sending rods around and chipping them was a train, so that didn't work. <laughs> they started to go downhill, and we had a big meeting. I was the vice president, right? So we had a board meeting. We used to have them every year. We had a board meeting. And uh, it was decided at the board meeting that William Mills would continue to be the sole distributor, sole agents of the Leonard Rock. And I said, well, where did that come from? I said, well, that was something that was signed way back when with Ireland and all that. I said, oh, OK. And they, believe it or not, they had all the records. So. I said, well, I, you know, someday I'd like to take a look at the record. So I went back, way back, and there never was an agreement that said William Mills and Son is the sole agent of Leonard and Rod. <laughs> so I know that there were rods sold directly out of the factory. <laughs> um, but basically, if you wanted a Leonard Rod, you had to go to William Mills and Son. I mean, there were exceptions, uh, but supposedly that was the rule. Well, when I found that out, I said, well, that, that makes a lot of difference. And I said, okay, fine. I called every every fly shop in the United States. I called fly shops in Europe. I 
talk to everybody. How would you like to have a letter? How would you like to be a letter dealer? And we put on, in that first year, I think, we put on 100 dealers. Uh, you know, every Bud Lilly, and I mean, I mean, you just name it, everybody wanted to be a And what, uh, what year was that? 72. I think 72, 71 or something. I think Dave Atwood became one of the dealers. Yeah. He designed the Leonard Bolstrom. Yeah. Later. Yeah. Well, the the problem uh, was that Len Leonard never had a catalog. I mean, he was always waiting bills and signing with everything in it, you know? Yeah. Right. So I sat down and Wayne Mills had cut, as I say, cut the number of rods that, were, were, that they wanted to sell. So those were the models that, that I knew. So in a matter of days, I threw together this little catalog, right? A little five by seven catalog. Um, and had it printed and started going to shows and started doing other things and passing out this little catalog. Well, that, that knocked sales up again. So, and there's a certain time period in there where, um, and Bobby, you can, you can verify that. Everybody was pretty calm and collected. I mean, we were making rods. We had, we were doing a good job. I mean, we were making a high quality rod. Uh, the beveler, we'd gotten into using uh, carbide tip saws on the beveler. We were getting more accurate cuts. Um, we were still at that time, still using um, high glue. Um, Milligan and Higgins high glue. Leonard Rod Company uh, used it, and the Encyclopedia Britannica used it to do the bindings on there. On their Thomas, Thomas used fish glue. Yeah, yeah. With this high glue, this is Milligan and Higgins high glue. I don't know what, what anything else about it, but it used to come in these. 50 pound bags and we melted it down and that was it. And uh, uh, did it stink? No, uh, it, it didn't stink. I don't remember it stinking you, Mom. What's that? Whether or not the high glue smelled. I don't think it smelled that. No, it didn't have to have it. Unless you burned it. Didn't burn it. Oh, yeah, burn it. It smelled like it. you were burning it. Of course, you know. Can we go back to the dirty for a second? Sure. And you're right, it was a fantastic casting. <laughs> Why did you switch from the green rack okay. to the ground rack? Was there anything that precipitated that? Is there yeah. any other yeah, difference we'll, in the rods? We'll get, we'll get into that in a minute. <laughs> we'll cover that. Okay. Um, then something okay. happened. Uh, uh, that I really, it's very hard for me to explain. Um, I got a telephone call one day and said, "Well, the meeting is going to be at Half's house. Uh, we're going to we're going to have dinner over there. The meeting is going to be at seven o'clock. So, uh, you know, I said, well, wait, who are you? You know, this person's telling me there's going to be a meeting. You know, he said, well, I'm Dave Beasley.' And I said, and? and he said, don't you know? about this? And I said, about what? And he said, well, Leonard has uh, a lawyer, Charlie Parker, Parker, Charlie Parker. He says, you better call him. And I said, what for? Why would I, why would I call him? He'll explain it. I can't explain it to you on the phone. And he hung up. So I went to this meeting, and there was Mr. Beasley and his son David and two other people from their university society down in, in uh, New Jersey. And uh, I said, well, what, what's this about? They said, well, we bought letter. I said, what? You bought letter rod? And they said, yeah, we have sold us, you know, his portion of letter rod <coughs> and, and we, want, we want to get some of your stock so that we can do a consolidated tax return. We have to own, I don't know, 60% of the company to form to be able to consider for a federal tax thing. And I said, so we need, 
you need 10% of your company, you know, your stock. I said, I'm not so. What do you guys think? What the hell? What the hell is this? You know? I mean, I had no idea. I had absolutely no idea that this was coming. I mean, it hit me broadside. So I said, well, what can you do for it? You know, for me? You know? Oh well, you know, we want to we want to improve the factory. We want to do this. We want to get people on different paper. Da 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 da. And they listed all this stuff. And I said, if you do that and put it in writing. I'll get you my, I'll give you my portion of the stock. And they said, okay, fine. Well, I have no idea how much money they spent, but they spent a ton of money at the factory. We got all new lighting, new benches. Um, we did the air conditioning, we did everything else. And then they took a look at the battle. And they said, what can we do? I mean, it's a wooden thing. You know, with a wooden track, on a wooden frame, we can make something better than that. So they hired a company called Brown Engineering, and they came down and looked at it and says, "Yeah, we can make one of those. You know, we'll do it. We'll put a Boston gear on it. It'll be all automatic. Blah 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 blah." So I said, "I said, fine. You know, if you can do it." And they said, "Well, what else can you do?" And I said, "Well, I'll tell you what. It's a bitch to go from tips to butts or tips to mids." Because you got to change every ground. The patterns are all different. You got to change the settings. So you know, you had a, we had all that written down. You know, like put the pin in number two hole. You know, to this. So I said, it'd be really be nice if we had another beveler. I said, oh yeah, no problem. So they they built us two bevelers, nineteen thousand dollars a piece. They built two bevelers. They built a third one that didn't have the Boston gear in it. Um, and Hap wanted, for some reason or other, he talked to Beasley, he said, I'm making one of these for him. That eventually went to Hal Bacon. Um, okay. So there were two 200 bevelers. And it was nice, because now you could cut, you know, you've cut 38 aces, man. You got tips on this one, you got butts on that one. It's really worked out great. So there were a lot of things, there were pay raises for everybody, <coughs> insurance, all kinds of stuff that we never had before. Unfortunately, they also bought a million dollars worth of inventory. And at the very first meeting they had, right, I came down there, you know, and, and there's Bill Karen from Morbus is there, you know. And I can't think of the other guy's name as a purchasing guy from Morbus. He was there. He'd already been, been hired, already been hired. So I said, well, What's the catalog going to look like? After all the talk, and they, they sat there and they held up an Orvis catalog and said, change the name from Orvis to Leonard, and that's the catalog. That's what we're going to do. Uh, oh, Was that Jim Beasley? Dave oh, Beasley. Jim, uh, Dave Beasley. That's before they sold it to those two, uh, those three guys from New Jersey. They, oh, they, no. They, no, 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 no. They sold it to Johnson Wax. Is where it Johnson was. Wax, yeah. yeah. Um, no, I'll, let me let me finish yeah. on. We'll, we'll get into that whole thing, right? So all of a sudden, Leonard is now selling women's clothing and dishes and <laughs> dog beds and all that, right? We're still making rods, and the rod sales were still going up, and we were doing really well. But the rest of the stuff was, you know, going downhill. So uh, that was a big mistake. Uh, something that never really should have been done. And as I say, I didn't have any, uh, I didn't have anything really to say about it. Um, why, what, why were you? When you say you were not, you had nothing to say, or were you just not given the say? I mean, if you still had a percent, good percentage ownership in that company. Why were you not, I'll say, consulted? Why were you not saying, you know, Ted, we're thinking of going this direction. What's your take on it? You know. Oh yeah. Did I did I object? <laughs> yeah. I, this I'm not a minority, but it's. I mean, I well, I, you know, I was, you know, I was a part owner, but uh, I think more than anything else, uh, the promise of what could be what could be done at the rod shop was my main concern. Right. You know, I mean, okay, fine. We're going to get machinery, better lighting. We're going to start paying these people more. Uh, you know, we're going to have 
insurance. We're going to have all this stuff, which was important to me, you know, because I, I, well, I don't know. I got, I really got close to everybody that was in there. You know, I mean, it wasn't, uh, you know, like I'm the boss. You know, it, it wasn't that way at all. So uh, I think that was a big thing. I, you know, I, I objected to it, but at the same time. You know, there were a lot of benefits that, that people had, and uh, you know, I, I went along with it, still owning my portion of it. You know? okay. uh, Thank you. I would have liked to have done other, had it go a different way, but that's the way it went. And when was that, Ted? I'm sorry, I missed the year of Christ. Um, uh, 70, I'm going to say five. That's been a long time ago. I can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> I'm lucky to remember what I had for breakfast. Yeah, you know. when, you take, when you said they bought um, like a million dollars in inventory, was that for the rod part of the no. operation? Or that was the women's clothes and dogs. That was the whole thing. Like that. That's what I thought. I, just yeah, I didn't have anything right. to do with the rod. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so. Uh, anyway. Um, became uh, an <coughs> interest in um, graphite, which came about in, around the same time period. And um, unfortunately, the design, I mean, I'd heard about it, you know, and Fenwick started making graphite, and people were starting to make graphite rods. 